Dr. Tammy, and I'm here with, of course, Dr. Pedram on the Health Bridge. And we have a really good friend here with us today. This is Tom Maltair, Certified Functional Medicine Practitioner. I'm so excited to hear what you have to say today. Oh, I'm so glad to be with you both. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, buddy. So nice you can recognize you. his face from uh, the Origins movie and some of the things that we've done. I love this guy. Um, one of the smartest people in the world in nutrition, and I mean that. Oh, That's what yes, you said to me it. earlier. Totally. Yeah, really. Totally. <laughs> Behind the scenes. I'm so yeah. fickle. <laughs> So today we're here to talk about plant-based medicine, plant-based yeah. nutrition, yeah. and really the, the distinction between what we call medicine here in the West especially. It seems like it's been so confused where if it's a pharmaceutical drug, it's, it's medicine and plants are just kind of plants and they've been brushed into some weird place. And you have the data on this. You've done a lot of the research on this. You've followed a lot of the research on this. Mm -hmm. And it's really compelling. So I, I was hoping we could get you to kind of open up on some of that uh, and help us understand how that, uh, that branch of medicine is starting to evolve and become very evidence-based. Yeah, w what a wonderful thing to actually happen because the reality is medicine for millennia has all been about roots, fruits, and shoots. It hasn't been about these synthetic compounds that are made in laboratories. People would go out and if you had some sort of illness, whether you were having diarrhea or you had some sort of headache, you could wander into the woods and you could harvest some sort of plant and you could pound it or you could make a tea out of it. And next thing you know, you'd be feeling better. So it truly has been is will always be medicine, even if there isn't a double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial to prove it for some specific mechanism, it is medicine. So I'm, I'm real excited to bring this to light. Well, and there's lots of reasons why there may never be a double-blind, placebo-controlled, because there's no patent medicine profit for these plant-based medicines. And it's so sad, we've lost our knowledge. We used mm. to know how to use our garden yes. for our families. Oh, right? Yeah, and I have to tell you, before I actually studied functional medicine, before I went to Bastyr University to get my two degrees in nutritional sciences, I studied with an herbalist. Oh. And I'll tell you what, I did six weeks of this apprenticeship. We went into the mountains, and we went out on the rivers and the ocean sides, and we harvested all sorts of different things. And I've never felt more alive. I've never felt more healthy, more connected to the land. Mm. And just being outside harvesting was medicine itself, but then taking these, ingesting these on a daily basis, my gosh. I'll describe it as if sometimes you're going along in life and you feel like you're heading upwind, right? Like there's constant blowing against you. When you start eating more plants, when you start having some of these tonifying plant medicines, it feels like somebody's blowing from behind and pushing you forward. Mm. What a beautiful analogy. Yeah. It feels great. So I, I want to, uh, when we talk about double blind studies, it's interesting because, yeah, we could say follow the money and say, well, there's no profit because you can't patent nature. So screw that. Just take this drug and then, you know, this is how we're going to isolate ingredients and right. all that. And, and let's go there, right? But uh, I do want to speak to grandma's wisdom, right? Because mm. if people have been taking this stuff for thousands of years and from generation to generation has been handed down, Mm. If it didn't cure the headache, it probably wouldn't have been handed down, right? <laughs> and, and so it's made it for thousands of years because there's been human trials and anecdotal stuff that's that's been confirmed through history. And there's a lot to be said for that because what a good percentage of the world's population uses plant medicine every mm. day, right? Absolutely. And the reality is... If you look around you, it's everywhere. If you go into somebody's house and they have a little oregano plant in their windowsill, or they have peppermint growing out on their front porch, or there's some sort of lavender or rosemary or thyme anywhere, the herb gardens, right? What are culinary herbs? They are medicines. They've been used to preserve life because before refrigeration, before we had any of this elaborate sanitation around us, we had bacterial infections. Yeah. So in order to combat these bacterial infections, people would spice their food. They would give certain basal compounds to the food or rosemary, rosemarinic acid compounds to the food that would actually counteract some of the infective organisms. So people would have wonderful flavors, of course, but they would survive and thrive because of those medicines. Wow, and you know, you were speaking about why patent medicine isn't motivating us. But you know, you and I were talking earlier about my patients who are wanting a quick fix. And so 
I think that's part of the problem and I'd love to hear, you know, how do you guide someone to consider plant-based medicine as a place, you know, there's a history to consider, there's the side effects, and there's so many reasons mm. why plants should be your first choice, not, oh, I've tried everything else, I guess I have nothing to lose, which is kind of the way it is now. Well, I guess I'll try diet. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know? right. And the interesting piece is, thankfully, like Pedram was talking about, double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials are happening in certain realms when it comes to medicine. So we have to come up with alternatives. We really do. If you look, the FDA just put out a warning just a couple months ago about NSAIDs being problematic, the non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, right? Within day zero of taking those drugs, day zero, meaning the instant That's you like start, <laughs> right? Mm. You have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke, so cerebrovascular disease, yeah. okay? Right from the get-go. And even, even though uh, aspirin was not included in that, that warning, you'll look and you'll see now, with everybody concerned about leaky gut and you know degradation of your intestinal tract, Within 10 minutes of taking a buffered aspirin for children, you'll see the degradation of the gastric cells. So you'll see the stomach starting to erode. Mm -hmm. So you'll have gut permeability within 10 minutes of taking these NSAIDs. It doesn't matter what class it is, okay? <laughs> Well, so, and we knew this, and that's the funny thing about traditional medicine is, you know, Celebrex and those prescription NSAIDs were taken off the market because of the increased risk mm -hmm. of stroke mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and cardiac events. Mm -hmm. But the over-the-counter NSAIDs were the same pathway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we just didn't choose to go there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. There was a lot of money being made, and there wasn't an alternative. That was the problem. People said there, there is no alternative. Okay. They weren't looking at sunlight. Right? Vitamin D is a very potent nociception uh, constituent. It, it cuts down on pain. There's really nice studies on diffuse musculoskeletal pain in people and getting enough sunlight or vitamin D supplementation, and all of a sudden, you know, 90% of the population's pain will go down, mm. right? So that's, that's awesome, right? But what about some of the things that we've known about in plant-based medicine for millennia, which are the curcuminoids, right? Mm. So turmeric, that bright orange color, right? We have these curcuminoids in there that have been very potent at shutting down the master switch of inflammation called nuclear factor kappa B, right? So this will help with bone density, it will help with depression, but it also helps with pain and inflammation. So we just recently had a trial looking at one of these forms of curcuminoids, something called Mariba. It's a phospho phospholipid-bound curcuminoid. So curcumin itself, you know, when you take it in, it, it doesn't always make it to the cells you want. So people are getting really creative, right, in a pharmaceutical type way of delivering these to the cells that need it in a kind therapeutic Kind of like a dose. magic bullet. Right, exactly. So this phospholipid appears to be 29 times more bioavailable than standard curcuminoids that you would just eat over the counter. And interestingly enough, they did a head-to-head -head comparison with acetaminophen, so Tylenol, for pain. And what they found was, is you had to kind of go high on the Mariba. It was about four grams per day, so two grams divided dose, right? So that's four caps twice a day. And they found it was head-to-head -head statistical significance. Wow. So you could actually reduce the pain as much as Tylenol. And your liver's happy with curcumin as opposed to super unhappy with Tylenol. I mean, it couldn't be polar opposite side effects. Well, that's interesting you would mention that, right? Because we do know that there are some metabolites from Tylenol that are actually quite toxic, and they can actually damage the liver to a point of leading someone to go to an emergency room and in some cases die. Yep. And the curcuminoids actually have the exact opposite effect. They seem to protect the liver, they seem to protect the GI tract, they seem to balance out microorganisms, they seem to prevent cancer. I mean, there's so many beneficial side effects. So instead of having this laundry list of like, hey, watch out for this, it's like, hey, let's enjoy this, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Go nature. Right? So what percentage, I mean, we're looking at pharmaceuticals and everyone's like, well, you know, this is science, but I'd say what, like 40% or so, last I looked, of the pharmaceuticals out there were derived from some sort of plant-based ingredient. Absolutely. And just said, hey, look, let's just alter it a little bit so we could patent it and use what, you know, the shamans have been using for millennia. Take the aspirin, where did that come from? It came from white willow bark, yeah. you know? Take the statin medications, where did that come from? Red, red yeast rice, you know? So yeah. they isolated one of the constituents called monocolon K, and there's multitude of monocolons. So 
All they do is they'll look at these plant constituents and they'll look at what's called the, the binding disassociation constant. So what's the one chemical that binds to that one enzyme that I want to manipulate and doesn't let go? They don't look at all the other chemicals that actually will bind a little and then let go and then bind a little and let go and have a wonderful result without the negative side effects. Right. So yes, it's about 40% and we're finding you know, plants all over the globe now to get more pharmaceutical awareness and we'll mimic those plants to get that, but we don't use the plants, which doesn't seem to make too much sense. Yeah. The distinction of how this aggressive pit bull-like model of pharmaceuticals, just grab and bind and go, and this is what we got, and this is what we've isolated, versus this diffusion of natural compounds. Mm -hmm. What does that do to the body? Like, how does the body react in different ways? I mean, obviously, uh, these pathways have been there for a very long time, but that one, like, super highway that they're trying to pound right now with this one isolated ingredient, is that what's causing a lot of these side effects? Like, how, how is this causing problems? Well, let's take one of the most prescribed medications out there, which is the statins, right? And you say it's an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor, okay? It's a specific enzyme inhibitor with these monoclonal Ks, right? So you isolate a substance, you combat, you battle a specific enzyme, you shut it down, but then you ask yourself, does the enzyme have any other function than to make cholesterol? And you say, well, yeah, it goes down the Farnesyl pathway and it makes something called ubiquinone or coenzyme Q10. And then you ask yourself, well, is coenzyme Q10 necessary for human health? And I don't you know. Say, Do you have a heart? <laughs> and then you say, well, wait a second. Coenzyme Q10 is the only nutrient that is directly involved, not indirectly like niacin or riboflavin, directly involved in the production of energy in something called the electron transport chain. It's the only nutrient. So if you're deficient in that particular nutrient, you can't run that electron transport chain as effectively, and therefore you don't have energy. And if you don't have energy, the heart may malfunction, your digestion may change, your brain function might go away. I mean, there's so many different things as a side effect. So is it any wonder that we end up with more actual diabetes and things that, you know, it takes a lot of energy to move glucose upstream in the human body. So yes. we end up doubling the risk of, of diabetes with the consumption of these statins over an extensive period of time. And what you'll see is a lot of minor symptoms that people don't associate with statin medications. So, you know, they'll look for something called muscle failure, called rhabdomyolysis. But what you'll have is you'll have cramping. You'll have Especially in the morning. Neuropathies, yes, bottom of the foot, the gastrocnemius, the calf, sometimes in the thigh muscle. You'll have these people have these little diffuse symptoms and they'll never associate it to this statin medication that coins on Q10 insufficiency. And yet the data is now pointing and saying, wait guys, wait, 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 wait. We overestimated the efficacy and we underestimated the side effects. Hmm. So let's yeah. go to something a little bit more natural. Well, and it's so aggressive. I had a patient whose CPK enzyme was so high I was looking at Lou Gehrig's as a oh possibility oh rather gosh. than his statin drug. And guess what yeah. happened? Down, we took him off his statin. Yeah. Completely normalized. 100, 250 milligrams tops, CoQ10. Sometimes people will add that after the statin neuropathies and whatnot, and all of a sudden, you know, give it a couple months' time. Now, the reality about supplementation, the reality about herbs is this thing, you know? Since you don't have this tight binding disassociation constant, you need to give it time. You can find in a short period of time statins will have efficacy, but some of these herbs, you need 30, 60, 90 days. Yeah. And then you'll go, oh, yeah, I'm seeing a little bit of effect. I mean, coenzyme Q10 is a supplement. Boy, I did some trials on some athletes who are deficient in coenzyme Q10, and it took over 45 days before they even noticed that stuff was in their system. So, you know, you have to be patient, right? Mm. And in our instant society, you know, if I have a headache, I want it gone right now. Mm. Well, <laughs> thankfully, that Mariva, right, that fancy curcuminoid, yes, within six hours, you'll notice that difference. And yeah, sometimes but it's six hours within, isn't what people are wanting. Sometimes it's two to three. But exactly, a lot of people want 15 minutes. They want yeah. 30 minutes, you know, so it's kind of tough. Oh, I want to go back and follow a couple breadcrumbs here because yeah. you mentioned something that got me um, kind of cascading down this place is if you were to take a substance that was to damage your gut lining mm -hmm. and then increase the permeability of that gut lining, which then could lead to leaky gut, then we're talking about 
autoimmunity and all sorts of other issues that we see with leaky gut, which is a tremendous amount of energy being invested now in the immune system mm -hmm. to fight the food that we're eating. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're, you know, we're swiping on a high interest credit card to get through today, but like the payments down downstream are just astronomical because now all of a sudden you've got, you know, gluten sensitivity, you've got dairy sensitivity, you're getting all sorts of like thyroid antibodies. Thyroid antibodies and it's like this whole cascade of chronic disease That's funny from that you. that one uh, kind of instant gratification that says, well, the Tylenol is going to get me out of this mess now. And, and the drugs used for that autoimmune stuff are even bigger and badder. Totally, <laughs> totally. Know? And then you're like, you're sentenced to this pharma pharmacological lifestyle. So the cost is not just our health, though. There's a huge cost to using pharmaceuticals instead of plants financially. Oh my gosh, absolutely. So as we're seeing right now in the news, right, <laughs> the government is actually taking this up with pharmaceutical firms and saying you can't increase the ratio by 750% on profit on a specific product because you monopolize the market. You can't do it, right? So yeah, the cost is huge. Here's the other aspect that's happening. We're seeing birds and fish high on Prozac. Oh my gosh. Mm. We're seeing all sorts of different anti-seizure medicines going through sanitation processes and coming out actually higher in the meds. So water that's supposed to be purified, faucet water that you're going to be drinking, goes through a sanitation process and it will actually come out with higher levels of pharmaceuticals because get this. Concentrated. Well, not only that, some of the pharmaceuticals that you're urinating out will end up in the water supply in metabolites. They'll end up in pieces. And it turns out that the microbes they use in the sanitation process are putting those pieces back together. Oh, those darn <laughs> bugs. <laughs> Smart Isn't bugs. That wild? Wow. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, okay, so what... Okay, now what, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, like, look, you could say I drink bottled water, but, like, what do you cook in? Like, when you go out... Oh, but they test cook your bottled milk. water, right? That's a whole episode right there. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And so people taking these pharmaceuticals are now putting them back into the ecosystem and the molecules are too small to get filtered out by municipal water mm -hmm. filtration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're going to have some sort of, I would say, continuation of the drug process out in nature. Mm. And it seems to be changing the actual behaviors of the animals. So mating will change as well as all sorts of habitat formation and nesting and all sorts of different things that are occurring. So of course they're on drugs, right? Why wouldn't they change, right? So if we're using natural based compounds, the cool thing is they're completely biodegradable and they're completely recognized by nature. So if you look at something like antidepressants, for example, one of the things that's got me really excited is one of my loves is uh, sulforaphane. Right? It turns out that the more we look at depression, the more we see it's all about oxidative stress, it's imbalance in the mitochondria, there's all sorts of different things occurring in the brain. And it looks like there is one magical plant-based chemical that can alter every single one of those steps. And it is this sulfur thing. Where's it found? Okay. Yeah. I know, so, right? Come on. <laughs> it's like a well, no, I just want people to like, sulforaphane is such a big word, but yeah. it's in a lot of the foods that you're eating, or yeah. hope supposedly eating. So the brassica family, the mustard family, if you are cooking something and it smells like there's baby diapers in the house, <laughs> then it's probably the cruciferous vegetable family, right? You have the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, arugula, cress family. So all these things here have this magical compound, and basically what it is, it's a pesticide. So right, Natural. plants produce magical compounds to protect themselves. And it turns out their protective compounds protect us. So a plant bites, uh, or excuse me, an insect will bite a plant, a broccoli for example. And as it bites it, the cell wall of the broccoli will release a specific enzyme. And that specific enzyme then all of a sudden pulls a little glucose off this little sulfur compound called sulforaphane and makes it quite reactive. So all of a sudden you get this bright, sulfury smell, and it's mildly toxic to insects, actually. But when we ingest it, that mild toxin actually goes into our cells and says, whoa, guys, I'm gonna pump you up a little bit. I'm gonna work you out a little bit, okay? This is a mild toxin, we gotta deal with this. So let's ramp everything up. I want you to just get prepared for nastiness, right? So it's like mm. a workout for your cells. Mm. So actually what it does is it separates a little constituent that binds to your DNA and starts reading hundreds treasure troves of enzymes. These are antioxidant enzymes, these are detoxification enzymes, and next thing you know, your cells function like they haven't in years. Hmm. 
So let's take, for example, there's a trial done. These guys who found this out, by the way, were Johns Hopkins University researchers, right? 1992, they said, wow, cancer rates are going through the roof. We've got to find something that can combat this cancer. So they looked at synthetics and they looked at natural compounds and they found that, wow, if you look closely in the research, the people, the animals who consume more cruciferous vegetables, they don't get cancers as much. Bladder cancer, colon cancer, rectal cancer, even breast cancer. So you say, wow, what is it? You know, what's going on? And they isolated this particular constituent and they found out when they ramped up antioxidants and you ramped up the ability to decrease the amount of toxins in each cell by detoxifying, that you could decrease all sorts of different diseases, right? So they went over and they said, all right, let's put this to test, right? Let's go to some place like China where they're ingesting all this you know, particulate matter in every single breath, right? Ooh, here's some more, right? I have to deal with all this. And one of the nastiest compounds are some of the benzene compounds that are in the air, right? Well, when they gave people sulforaphane-rich beverages, so watercress, broccoli sprout beverages, they found that they got over 61% increase of some of these nasty compounds getting excreted from people's body in their urine. So that was awesome. And then they said, well, wow, what, what can we do with animals? Let's spread some of this sulforaphane on the skin of nude mice and let's give them a lot of radiation and let's see who gets cancer, right, skin cancer. And the mice that had the sulforaphane on the skin, barely any tumors at all. The people who didn't, or the mice that did not, tons of tumors, right? So they're, oh my gosh, well, let's apply this to even more stuff. So now there's recent trials in autism. Zimmerman et al. with the Johns Hopkins crew, they went out and they lowered a tremendous amount of symptoms on autism. Recent trials are now looking at Alzheimer's and cognitive decline, Parkinson's disease, you name it, depression. They're actually looking at major and medium depression cases and using sulforaphane. So sky's the limit when it comes to ramping up the cellular function, but I wanna, I wanna point out what happened here. You didn't just come in and hit one enzyme. You came in and you tonified the cell. You changed the gene expression. You stimulated DNA to make more enzymes. So you're not inhibiting anything. You're actually encouraging something. So it builds up the entire system. There's something really powerful in that, right? It seems like it's a stylistic shift away from the 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 way pharmacology has been thought through is finding something, snuffing something out, finding a problem and, and eradicating that problem. And what we're talking about here is supporting the system's natural ability mm. to be adaptive, mm -hmm. right? And it's a very different look at it. But is this, is this kind of the birth of a new pharmacology? Like, is there a way to find these, these isolated substances uh, and use them, like kind of like what we did with Mariva and getting the phosphorus to bind in a, in a new direction of thinking where our science and our plant-based kind of wisdom go hand in hand? Or is it better to just eat the broccoli sprouts? Do we not know yet? <laughs> well, there's probably gonna be a balance of all the above, but the reality is I think we need to just incorporate more plants into our diet. So I'm gonna give you an example, right? There's a lot of people out there who are taking statins for cholesterol issues. There's a lot of people who are taking things like metformin and glucophage for blood sugar issues. And if those people were just eating more bitter plants, if they were eating compounds that would balance out the microbes in their gut, then they may not have a permeable gut, a leaky gut. And if they didn't have a leaky gut, then they wouldn't have elevated inflammation, changing of the metabolism of blood sugar and fats, lipids. So I'll give you an example. I mean, there's a lot of attention going to something called berberine alkaloids right now. These yellowish berberine. compounds, right? And they're extremely bitter, extremely bitter. What are they found in? Oregon grape, something called coptis. You'll hear golden seal, right? A lot of these things. Oh my gosh, I, I harvest this up in my neck of the woods with my kids. We have Oregon grape that grows out in the woods behind our house everywhere. And this stuff, my gosh, if you ever scrape it, I'll take my knife out, whoosh, I'll scrape a little bit of the bark and I'll just stick it in my mouth. And I'll tell you, it sucks up all the moisture. It's really astringent. All of a sudden, you know, if I give it to the kids, they're like, oh, oh you know? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, come on, you know, fuck up, here we go. But you feel, you can feel a change in your entire digestive system by putting that bitter sensation in your mouth. Mm. 
So while I'm looking at the research on these bitter alkaloids and I'm starting, oh my gosh, they balance out microbes, they change digestion, they're anti-inflammatory, they're incredible. I mean, there's trials actually comparing for women with PCOS head to head, metformin and berberine, you know, at anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 milligrams a day. And they're finding similar results. So it's, it looks really, really promising. But when you get down to it, it may be because it's shifting the microbes, it's shifting the digestive process. So you begin to wonder, wait a second, maybe we're just babying ourselves by going to the grocery store and getting all these mild vegetables that aren't bitter. They're very sweet and they're very tangible. You know, I mean, you, you taste regular lettuce, right? And you eat it and you're like, oh, this is so lovely, right? <laughs> if you go into the woods with me and you had harvested the wild lettuce, you'd go, whoa, this is so bitter, right? Yeah. So maybe it's just the natural compounds around us would give us medicine like that mm. all the time, every meal, if we're conscious of it. So I think the reason we have to concentrate things, I think the reason we have to put these fancy little methods of delivery and whatnot is because we've come so far from center, right? Normally, you're gathering roots, fruits, and shoots as part of your daily life in the mm. Origins movie. If you were a bushman, Yes, you would hunt, but yes, you would be getting tubers, and yes, you'd be getting berries, and yes, you'd be getting leaves. You'd be getting all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, yes, I think there will be a balancing of people saying, instead of pharmaceutical, I'm going to give you this fancy form of a food. And I think people coming back to center and getting outside and harvesting their own stuff and growing their own stuff and getting some of the heirloom varieties that still have a bit of a bite to them, may balance things out without needing heavy pharmaceuticals. Mm. But you know, it's interesting. I, I have a plant-based approach to cholesterol, and we, you know, we talked about that a lot. And I think that people have to think two and three times what a plant-based meal really means. And I know mm. that might surprise you because you know, you, you, live, you live plants, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know, we'll be talking about, and then they'll say, oh yeah, and then, you know, I can just have a vegetarian sandwich, and I was like, no, but the egg is not a plant, and it's, it's a real mind shift mm. in what is a plant, you know, you really have to think of dirt. Yeah, yeah, you know who does that really well is my friend Terry Walls, right? She does. So she got herself out of a wheelchair from MS. I actually read her original book, you know, out of the chair. And it was phenomenal to see, you know, how many vegetables she would consume on a daily basis. Have you she, been to a conference with her? She just has a she's mound of vegetables. Multiple plates full of vegetables, at least two servings of sulfur-based vegetables a day, right, which would have the sulforaphane in them. Lots of color, lots of greens, right? So it's... Yeah, it is the medicine. And she'll say, she's, you know, she tried going gluten-free, dairy-free, and then she went paleo, and it wasn't until she hit all the vegetable consumption that the whole disease progression reversed. Yeah, because a lot of people can be paleo mm. and not eat vegetables. I think a lot of people do. I think uh, people take paleo as this like free ticket to eat bacon and like not you know it's <laughs> like steak. it's like original atkins where it's just like sweet i get to eat the things i want to eat and yeah. if you miss the vegetables you've missed the train like that's not what paleo was right. they mostly ate tubers and roots and shoots and if yeah. they got a deer or an antelope or whatever it was like party time right, right? but it's not easy to get that and it's a treat yeah. uh, you brought me back to some really interesting uh chinese medicine roots oh. first of all coptis is huang lian which is an, a substance that i've taken I, I will not travel without it it is yes. the if number one bacterial diarrheal infections yes it oh has gosh. saved my Ew. life in india Ew. it has saved my life in Ew. India. So it saved my life in Peru. It, it really, really works. It is one of the it's best. Amazing. And um, I have like all this lettuce in my garden, and it is bitter, right? Mm. And so it makes me think of you know the literal translation of kung fu. There's two two ways to, to see it. One is hard work, but the other translation is eat bitter. And it's built in because when I ask you, how's your Kung Fu? I'm not asking you whether or not you beat up people today. It's how are you withstanding the challenges of life and becoming an agent of, of change, like that genetic expression that makes you a warrior, wow. Wow. right? And, and it makes me think of ginsenocides, like the strongest ginseng yeah. is the one that had to fight the hardest to get out. So I'd love for you to talk about the, the substances. Like when you go wild harvest, like a blackberry, yeah. what is different? in the chemical constituency of a, of a real raw plant that had to fight its way through life? 
Well, let's look at that. Let's look at berries, for example. Yeah. Um, blackberries, you know, they grow everywhere. But we have, uh, and they're, they're only in the low country. You know what I like to see as a difference of flavor is the blueberries, actually. Mm. Because if you were to harvest a blueberry around my house, which is, you know, only 500 feet above elevation, or you came with me to the upper hills and we're harvesting a blueberry at about 45 or 5,000 foot elevation, you know, the voles are going nuts on that blueberry, right? The temperature changes at night are drastic. You can be well below freezing and then you'll be totally sunny in the daytime, 50, 70 degrees, whatever it is. So that the plant itself has to form a bunch of protective chemicals to make sure it doesn't freeze, to make sure it can survive the attack by the voles. So it's a resilience factor. Right? Some of these anthocyanidin type compounds will ramp up, some of these pigments will ramp up like nobody's business in the lower teeny varieties that grow way up in the Alpen region. And I would just say, I would challenge you to listen to your taste and listen to your taste. Mm. Seriously, because if you took a little teeny blueberry from the Alpen meadow versus a blueberry from the grocery store that's massive and you put them in your mouth, you could tell right away mm. something is completely different in it. There will be a little bit of bitter, there will be a little bit of sour, and there will be some wild tones of sweet that are completely unusual and glorious. Mm. So I would say it's more an adaptation process. You get any sort of UV, UVB, UVA radiation higher in the higher altitudes, you get any of those snaps of cold, you get any changes in the mineral content in the soil, and that plant has to work harder then it becomes stronger. It mm. has that bitter life. And so it pushes through that and you get that resilience from the plant itself. That is some powerful stuff because metaphorically, it really speaks to how we can look at life and how we mm. can look at using plant-based medicine, not just for medicinal, but preventative. So if I'm listening to this and okay, I don't, maybe I'm not diabetic, I don't have you know, cholesterol issues yet, how do I avoid that iceberg? What mm. like the, so I take the sulfur the sulfur based vegetables. I'm having broccoli. I'm having blueberries. Like how do I source this in my life to open up my genetic expression and not be put into the position where someone's throwing pills at me? And I have a question that mm. is great to before that because we are where we are, and our taste buds don't want it yet. yet. Right. Right. So how do we cleanse the palate as we would cleanse our liver or, uh, you know, do it? And how do you, especially oh. kids, you know, you've got kids. How do you go there? Pedram knows this answer. <laughs> Just I love, do I, it? No, I love, <laughs> you, I love you, this answer, you, actually. You, you dig up your yard and you plant a garden. Mm -hmm. So the reality is when you are attached to a plant and you watch the entire birthing growing process, right? So you nourish that soil and you're giving it compost and then you plant this little precious seed and then you're watering on a daily basis and then you're cheering it every day. You're like, come on plant, you can do it, you can do it, right? And flower. it grows and your kids are right there next to you. Mm. Watch what happens. Mm. So I've actually done this. I took some neighbor kids who would not touch vegetables and I gave them a plot in my garden. And these two boys, I tell you what, they went from hating vegetables to running out every day and saying, oh my gosh, look at that, a new kale leaf. Right? Oh. Broccoli, I have my own broccoli. Chop broccoli, eat raw, you know. Nice. Mm. So mm. it's really getting people invested in the process itself that really gets them tied to it. And that's the same with culinary herbs. I would say, gosh, you, you know, it doesn't take anything to grow peppermint. No, it's like a weed. Peppermint, yeah. yeah, keep it in a pot, you know. Yeah. If you put it in your garden, that's all you'll have is a peppermint garden, right? Yeah. So you grow peppermint, and it looks like all the new data now. Everybody's talking about SIBO, right? Small yeah. intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Looks like the data on peppermint oils is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, so you can actually stop bacterium from communicating with one another. You can actually break apart something called a biofilm that they form by just eating a little bit of peppermint. And oregano. And it's delightful. Oregano, rosemary, rosemary seems to do a little bit. But I actually grow stevia next to my, my peppermint, and so my kids can have little peppermint candies on a daily basis. Nice. So they grab a leaf of stevia, a leaf of peppermint, and boom, away they run. So all you have to do is get people involved, invested, and then all of a sudden their taste buds will adapt. It's pretty interesting. So I have to confess. I'm a double board certified MD, and I'm an MD, but I got board certified in naturopathic medicine, and I desperately want to have a garden, but I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I have a garden plot, 
this is year three. My asparagus are like, th 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 and mm. my broccoli are beautiful flowers, but they became nothing. The only thing I can grow is zucchini. Mm. And it's, you know, I'm not stupid for real, but I can't do this. I would love, and I just doubled it, the mm. size. Oh, great. I thought maybe I just didn't give them enough room. Maybe they're unhappy, but I would love, you know, we don't live that far apart. Oh gosh. So I did it for Pedro. I'll come down. It'd be great. And then we can film it and yeah. everybody can have like this step-by-step -step guide mm. to at least a successful Northwest garden. Sure. Because there's some Absolutely. things that do grow all year, like kale and chard. You, yeah, and you can overwinter some of the kales. Absolutely. Yeah. I would, I would love that. I don't even, and I think that's what a lot of our viewers are. They're just stuck. They have a deep desire to have more plants sure. in their diet. and. But where do you even start? I would don't even know. Is it a sunny thing? I grew spinach one year. I was told, oh, they don't grow well if it's a sunny spot. I don't know. Yeah, it depends on the filtering of the light and all sorts of different factors. We'll look at your soil. We'll look at where your light's coming from. We'll definitely check out the temperature, yeah, because some things like to be more sheltered. So if you're growing a fig, it has to be closer to a house. So there's lots of different things to think about. So it'll be fun. We'll oh, check it that out. That would be so great. We do have yeah. successful rosemary. I married an Italian, so we have... Oh, okay a big pot of rosemary, but that, <clears throat> other than that, I'm just a... But see, wait a second, right? Wait a second. So let's come back to plants as medicine, yeah. right? Here you are, double board certified MD, okay? Yeah. And you probably have been recommending for uh, quite a long time hypertensive medications, right? Yes. So you say, I would like to give you a thiazide diuretic, I would like to give you a beta blocker, and now we're seeing because of um, Mark Houston, who's a very brilliant man from Vanderbilt, that, gosh, these medications, each individual medication can lead to a 5% increase towards type 2 diabetes for every year that you're taking it. Which is just okay. the worst disease ever. But if you look at the literature, New England Journal of Medicine, some very conventional journals, JAMA, they've been looking at something called the DASH diet. Oh, yeah. Dietary approaches for stopping hydrotension. And what's the key component of the DASH diet? Plants. Eat more vegetables. Yeah. Eat more vegetables. Mm. So instead of us saying, hey, here's this medication. We could be saying, you know, some people need the medications. I'm not dissing the medications. They have to have them in some cases. But you could also say, if you are concerned about lowering your blood pressure, you should be concerned about digging in your soil. Oh, I love that. You and should be concerned about going outside and familiarizing yourself with plants. And I think that traditionally, you know, a long time ago, pharmaceutical drugs were considered, you know, a poison. Mm. that was to be used judiciously for the shortest amount of time possible. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do put people on traditional hypertensive drugs when their blood pressure is 200 over 100. Sure. But that's only until we can get that little bit slower, you know, naturopathic, plant-based, vegetable-based problem mm -hmm. solved mm -hmm. more naturally. So you can do it simultaneously and then wean off those pharmaceutical drugs Absolutely. that have so many side effects. Absolutely, yeah. But I'll tell you what, I mean, there's a reason why I always say this. I say plants are wise. And when we dive into pharmaceuticals, the interesting piece is we keep on coming up with untold side effects, right? Yeah. Every year we find out there's something else, you know, oh my gosh, the proton pump inhibitors, now there's a warning that they deplete magnesium, and oh my gosh, now that we heard with the NSAIDs and the cardiovascular disease, the opposite's happening with the plants. The more research that comes out, the more we see their wisdom. And their mm -hmm. benefits. The more we see these positive side effects, mm -hmm. oh, it's, it's not just blood pressure now, it's depression. And it's not just depression, now it's asthma. It's not just asthma, you know? Boom, 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 boom. Ow. They're wise, plants are wise. So if I'm listening to this and I'm on medication <clears throat> and you know, I look, I don't like it, but you know, I might die if I don't do it, right? So right. obviously I'm not gonna just come cold turkey off medication, no, that's silly. Don't. Yeah, and a physician right. who wise. put you on yeah. should be involved yeah. in taking you off. But right. prove to your physician you don't need it anymore. Exactly, so now if my physician's not down, I'm ready to find a new physician. But if I'm working with a physician who's willing to work with me, if I could just add plants, and, and add some of these botanicals pressure. and the bo and the blood pressure starts coming down, I'm gonna have to adjust that medication anyways, but yeah. or my physician's gonna have to adjust that medication anyways, right? Yeah. 
That's, that's a key factor because, for example, we were just talking about blood pressure medication. If someone came off cold turkey of something like a beta blocker, they could have some severe side effects. Rebound hypertension. Exactly. Not a good idea. No. So the reality is you always want to work with your primary care physician. They are the wizards of pharmaceuticals. That's what they're taught in school. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you have some sort of alternate person, like a functional medicine trained practitioner, for example. Or the one with both. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And that's the idea. Yeah, you're, you're a unicorn. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, the so brain that's door unicorn. Why we're so busy is because it's it. such an oddity. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So if you can have that kind of team member, right, and then you have the alternative team member, so the two would work together. So it's very, very important to balance mm. out the two. And the cool thing is, is that I'm seeing, working with the Institute for Functional Medicine, watching doctors graduate from there, right, is that everybody's excited, right? A lot of the alternative practitioners really want to get in touch with, you know, how do you balance out the pharmaceuticals? And a lot of the conventionally trained practitioners are really excited about learning more about the plant-based stuff. So you, mm. you, you form these relationships, you form these teams, and then everybody grows from it. It's a wonderful experience. Yeah. We're in a, a renaissance, really. There's yeah, a very totally interesting are. time that we're in, and because we're in it, it's sometimes it's hard to see. Yeah. But medicine is changing, and you know, old institutions that are very profitable are freaking out trying to figure out how to keep people on their products. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's this kind of plant-based resurgence uh, with uh, data-driven mm. science that's being driven by people that are like, screw this, the world's in trouble what can we figure out that works? And it turns out that, you know, grandma was right. The herbalists might have been right. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that's worth looking at and preserving in our natural environment that I think um, you, you've you done a lot on this. You, you follow a lot of this literature. So I would love to get some resources from you for our listeners as well. And just some oh, of the sure. kind of cool stuff that you're looking at and just keep you in. I mean, anyone who's been watching well.org stuff knows that I won't leave this guy alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's the cool thing is that, you know, not all of this is ever going to be proven scientifically with a study, but there's a lot that is. Mm. And I love that you know the studies and that a lot of this, you can have huge confidence. It is evidence-based. Yeah. Plant medicine is evidence-based at this point in time. People think, oh, you know, there's no study for that. Actually, there is. You okay. just have to dig. <clears throat> can I tell you a quick story? Yeah. Okay. So um, after my apprenticeship at the Herbalist, right, and I was spending every day out hiking in the woods and getting to know plants and whatnot, and I felt so fabulous. And I came down and I told you know, my parents and I told my neighbors and I said, oh, you gotta try this plant for this and this plant for that. And then, you know, one of these things I said, oh, you, you know, you're having blood sugar problems? Oh, maybe you should try something called Oplopanex, which is a devil's club. And you know, it helps to tonify and whatnot. And they're like, well, how do you know that? Well, my friend watched a bear go out and instinctually know when it came out of its den and was looking kind of mange, it knew to dig up that particular root and eat that root every day and he watches that bear got its health back and strength that was the only season they've ever seen the bear get that specific plant it's as if it knew that right so i was like well, there's some wisdom here guys there's something you know the native americans do the, the indigenous cultures across the globe they all do this like how is it that we're separating ourselves from this process right this seems to be the process of life if we were in touch with what our nose wanted, our eyes wanted, if we were in touch with the feeling of food versus this gustatory satisfaction on two second taste bud, you know, <laughs> bursting like, oh, you know, sweet and sour and, you know, fatty, it's Hot. great. Right, Spicy. salty, right? Instead, we were like, mmm, how does this feel for my entire being, right? Maybe we'd be like the bear. Mm. Maybe we'd be walking outside and going, you know, how do I feel today? Oh, you know, I probably need this plan, right? And I think eventually we'll get back to that point. And that's what I'm excited for. I love it. I love it. So yeah. you can see why we love this guy, <laughs> Tom Maltair. Uh, man, yeah. great to see you as always. And uh, looking to forward to having I'm you so back. I'm so excited for my spring visit oh, to get yeah. my garden. We'll have a blast. You know uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be great. Well, thank you so much. Just my so much great information. Ah, happy to share anytime. Dr. Pedram, Dr. Tammy with Tom Maltair. See you next time on the Health Bridge. <laughs>